So sleep apnea is actually a very common problem. It's become a national epidemic that affects approximately 10 to 20 percent of Americans. We expect this number is only expected to grow. It's a chronic disorder of sleep and breathing in which the upper airway actually obstructs and collapses during sleep. And this can lead to disruption, disruptions in sleep as well as decreased oxygen levels throughout the night. So CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure, is the gold standard treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. The way CPAP works is it actually blows air into a tube and into a mask and then into the patient to help splint the upper airway open during sleep. And we know that CPAP effectively treats sleep apnea and many of its consequences. So it sounds pretty great, actually. <laughs> it's very effective, but unfortunately, only about 50% of patients, or about half of patients, actually use CPAP on a regular basis, meaning at least four hours per night, most nights per week. So there's a fairly large gap in treatment. This is a question that comes up fairly often. And I can understand why patients have this question, because there's uncertainty in what patients are told in terms of recommendations for cleaning equipment and also replacing equipment. Patients do have a lingering concern that using equipment over and over again could lead to exposure to certain respiratory pathogens that may cause upper respiratory infections. As clinicians, we don't have great data to draw on, to be honest with you. There aren't any well-designed studies that really support or refute this conclusion. So it's an important clinical question that we really do need to study, and so we're very excited to have this opportunity to study it through the Wellspring Board mechanism. The primary goal of this proposal is to evaluate the frequency and the different types of, of upper respiratory infections in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea who are getting ready to start CPAP. And we want to compare these rates before they start CPAP and afterwards. We also want to explore whether or not there are certain patient populations, patients with chronic diseases, for example, who may be more or less prone to upper respiratory infections after they start their CPAP. And this can be accomplished actually fairly easily using available patient data that we have right here at the University of Michigan. So the plan is to look into the electronic medical records of about 4,000 patients with obstructive sleep apnea who've had their CPAP started here at the University of Michigan and evaluate their upper respiratory infection rates two years prior to starting CPAP and then two years after they start CPAP to see if there's a difference. And we can do this actually very efficiently using an electronic medical record search engine that was actually created here at the University of Michigan. Uh, many researchers use it, myself included. It's called EMERS. And EMERS is a very handy tool that allows you to query hundreds of patient medical records at one time using specific search terms so we can identify who have had uh, recent um, upper respiratory infections in the pre-CPAP period as well as the post-CPAP period. And this is much more efficient given that we're looking at 4,000 charts. We wouldn't want to have to review those manually. That could take some time. First one, the most important one, is to answer this patient's question, to find out whether or not there really is an increased risk of upper respiratory infections after CPAP use. But regardless, using a data set this large, uh, this gives us the ability to really gain some important new insight on relationships between obstructive sleep apnea, CPAP, CPAP treatment, upper respiratory infections, and even other clinical variables that are important to the public. This stuff is, this has never been studied before, so this is going to be important information that we gather from the study. Thank you so much for your interest in this, and we wish you all the best for your study. Thank you.